whatever we're working with. All right. Okay, let's just have a bit of a reminder about some GCSE stuff. Uh, we know that reactions can be exothermic or endothermic. Let's just have a bit of a reminder of which is which. Could you give me a quick, you know, sort of half sentence, just a reminder about what exothermic and endothermic mean, written down, and um, some examples of some exothermic reactions couple of examples of endothermic reactions. It's quite hard to think of endothermic reactions. They're, they're a lot less common um, for, for reasons that we will discuss. Right, uh, let's, do the, um, let's do the back corner over there. <laughs> Focus. Um, what could I do with my pen? <laughs> Janet, can you start us off, please? Exothermic reactions. Oh, can we get the definition first? It does what, sorry? Release energy. And what you've, what you've done there is, is made the point that we define exothermic and endothermic in terms of direction. Which direction is the heat going? If it's going from the chemicals or from the reaction to the surroundings, that's exothermic. It's giving out heat to its surroundings. Um, you mentioned, of course, very good, the... Uh, dissolving anhydrous copper sulfate in water. We, we did that just the other day. That's a really good example of an exothermic reaction. Uh, any more, Matthew, that you can think of? Combustion is the single best example of an exothermic reaction. We're very familiar with it. We know things burn. We know that when things burn, they, they release heat. Yeah, we, we, we've... Uh, you know, we've all been burned by flames, it's a good experience. Um, uh, any others we can think of on that table? Not sure. Okay, well, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, Sujin, could you give me the definition of endothermic? So uh, that word absorb is quite a good one. And again, it's not just taken in, it's taken in from the surroundings, isn't it? Yeah, it's about absorbing that energy. So that's why people get confused about things like um, putting, putting water in an ice cube tray and sticking it in the freezer and then the water freezes. So exothermic or endothermic? Well, which way is the energy going? Is the, is the water absorbing energy from the surroundings? Not really. Yeah, the water is losing heat, isn't it? It's losing heat to the surroundings. So water freezing is exothermic. So we try and get away from that idea that, you know, exothermic reactions are hot and endothermic reactions are cold. That's when people make mistakes. You think about hot and cold. That's not what, that's not what exo and endo mean. Exo means releasing heat to the surroundings. Uh, examples of endothermic, they're a little bit harder to come up with. Um, just, I just wanted to do a uh, 
Yeah, that's fine. Just uh, find a find a space. Carry on. Um, Moen, any examples of endothermal reactions? The what? Sorry. Right. Yeah. The old um, the old sports injury pack. Yeah. Do you know Do you know what's happening in a sports injury pack? It is endothermic. Yeah, you're right. What What kind of reaction is it? Can you picture what's in a sports injury pack? We know you know, Addy. Put your hand down. There's no ice in a sports injury pack. Water and and something else. Okay, come on, Addy. Okay, I I I thought you were going to give us the full chemical oh, yeah. breakdown okay. there. What, what actually happens when an ice pack is um um the water at the time would actually be ice normally, and you actually put it on you put it on the side of injury, and energy is absorbed from um, uh, the side of the injury. Uh, heat energy is absorbed from the skin where the um, energy is, which melts the which melts the ice. No, it's an ice pack, an ice pack, okay, let's distinguish, an ice pack, right, which could be, you take out of your freezer, could be anything, could be a pack of frozen peas, and if you put, put a pack of frozen peas on an injury, it'll reduce the inflammation and, in, and, in, and improve the prognosis, right, that's, that's what an ice pack is, a sports injury pack is a room temperature, you have a box of them, they're just sitting in the back of your PE office, and they contain a, a, a sealed little pack of water, and a chemical, it's called ammonium nitrate, it's a solid salt. When you smack the ice pack, or the, the injury pack, the water packet breaks, and then the water mixes with the ammonium nitrate and dissolves it. That's all that's going on, it's just dissolving. But ammonium nitrate dissolves endothermically, it absorbs the heat. So that's when the ice pack, injury pack, gets cold. Okay. So some dissolving reactions are endothermic, but I'm not going to write it down because some dissolving reactions are exothermic. And we'll explore dissolving in more detail in year 13 and see why some are endo and some are exo. Um, a reaction that's always endothermic. Can I throw that one out there? Okay, that, that's true. I, I'm not going to write it down, though, because, strictly speaking, heat energy is not absorbed during photosynthesis. It's light. So although it absorbs energy in order to do the reaction, and the reaction is incredibly complex. It's not a one-step kind of thing, is it? Um, uh, yeah, I want an example where it's definitely heat. Neutralization. Neutralization, did you say? It's a really good example of exothermic. Neutralization is always exothermic. You add an acid to an alkali, it'll get hot. Endo? That's the one. So if there's a, a substance uh, like calcium carbonate, if I heat it, it'll break down to calcium oxide and CO2. Another reaction that you do in year 11. Do you remember this one, Eddie? Thermal decomposition reaction. Cracking, that's right. So if I, uh, what am I doing here? C2H4, C2H6. There we are. Um, yeah, cracking is an example of thermal decomposition that you come across. These reactions involve bond breaking, as we'll, we'll clarify later in this course. Bond breaking is always endothermic. Bond making is exothermic. But to break bonds, I have to put energy in to tear the atoms apart. Okay, grand. All right, so we have a pretty clear idea about that. That's, um, yeah, GCSE stuff. Um, there, there are other examples here of uh, exothermic reactions, but we'll, we'll come to those as and when. Um, right, let's talk about the enthalpy change then. Delta H. So... We use this, this symbol, delta H, 
friends will be changed where de the symbol delta, the triangle is the Greek letter delta, uh, is just uh, for change. And H is the symbol for enthalpy, which is a kind of made up word, means chemical heat energy. And, and you'll hear me interchangeably talk about enthalpy as heat and talk about enthalpy as energy. But I, I'll, I'll try and use the word enthalpy. That's the, that's the correct word. Um, and uh, enthalpy change um, is going to be either a negative number or a positive number. And the, 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 the way we work it is that if it's negative, it's exothermic and endothermic is positive. And that's because we're talking about the reaction from the point of view of the chemicals. If the chemicals have lost energy to the surroundings, that's, that's a negative number. If, you've, you know, if money's come out of your bank account, that's a negative, that's a withdrawal. As far as the chemicals are concerned, they've got less energy at the end than they had at the start. So negative, and vice versa for, for endothermic. Um, just mentioned that uh, the enthalpy change delta H is the energy change uh, measured in kilojoules per mole. We'll look more about that later on, but kilojoules per mole at constant pressure. Okay. So that's just the definition of, of enthalpy change. The energy change for a reaction measured in kilojoules per mole at constant pressure. That's just the definition. Okay. So let's get into some, some nitty gritty then of, of uh, reactions and we're gonna introduce a new idea. A lot of S's. Hess's law. And this is the, the most important idea of this whole lesson that we're doing here today. Uh, Hess's law. Entropy change. For a process. is independent of the route taken. Enthalpy change for a process is independent of the route taken. So, what does that mean? If I, if I go from, from here to Chester, whichever route I take, whether I go on the train or walk or fly, I'm going to use the same amount of energy. That's, that's not something that really applies in our world, is it? Uh, in energy changes independent of the route taken. But it does apply in chemistry, and I'll, and I'll, try, and, I'll try and explain what I mean by that. Let's say I'm changing chemical A into chemical B, reactant into a product, whatever they are. And the energy change for that reaction is an amount of enthalpy, an amount of energy, delta H1, going to call that. But now, let's imagine that there's a sort of an intermediate chemical, C, and I can go from A to C, and then from C to B. And I have enthalpy changes for those reactions as well. After two comes three. There we are. That's better. So to get from A to C is a amount of enthalpy delta H two delta H three to get from C to B. Okay. So in in maths terms, Hess's law says 
delta H1 and delta H2 plus delta H3. That's what Hess's law is telling us. Doesn't matter how I get from A to B, the amount of energy changing will always be the same. Just let's have a think about a couple of bits to do with entropy change. Yes, go for it. Even if, for example, you added a chemical D, would the um, would the entropy change from like A to C plus C to D plus D to V still be? Doesn't equal matter to how D many steps there are. Would still um, be equal to H1. That's right, and we'll be looking at uh, when we get to year thirteen. We'll be looking at these huge cycles that involve seven or eight different entropy changes. And we can we can add them all up and, and work out the missing one. They're called Born Harbor cycles. So that's uh, that's a topic you'll you'll get to either at the end of year twelve or beginning of year thirteen. Okay, let's um, let's let's give an example of uh, of a you know a real entropy change for a real reaction. It's a reversible reaction. Some of you might remember this, very common reactions used a lot in the last topic of GCSE, uh, separates science. Anyone recognise it? The Harbour process. You did. Yeah. Yeah. Harbour process for making ammonia. It's a very important reaction because ammonia is then made into fertiliser and we need fertiliser to grow food. So the discovery of this reaction that we can make fertiliser from hydrogen gas and literally thin air uh, is a, was a very important one. Uh, delta H for that is minus 92 kilojoules per mole. Okay. So I'm going to write two other reactions down now. So let's go for half M2 plus 3 over 2 H2 gives us an H3. What would delta H be for that reaction? And then it's a reversible reaction, so I could do, uh, yeah, let's do 2 for that, M2, 3, H2, okay. So I'd like to write this down, have a guess at what, what do you think delta H will be for these two reactions? I'd like to actually commit something to paper for this and... Um, Tell us what you think. Um, so uh, most people were fairly happy with this one. Yeah. Now, uh, because delta H, the sign is so important, we're always going to use a sign. But you, you might think it's a bit of a waste of time putting a plus in front of ninety-two, but um, remember that you've, you've been writing like plus two for a charge of magnesium for, for years. It's never bothered you because that, that plus or minus in, in a charge is really vital, isn't it? And it's really vital for, for delta H as well. That, that whether it's exothermic or endothermic is going to make a big difference. And it's, it's the kind of thing which is going to trip you up. If you, if you always put a sign in front of your delta H value, it'll remind you that it can be positive or negative, and that'll remind you just to check. Hang on, is this is this a combustion reaction? So hang on, that must be negative then. Com combustion's always negative. That sort of that sort of thought process. Or always kilojoules per mole. Okay, so yeah, as as you said, if a reaction's uh, exothermic in one direction, it's always endothermic in the reverse direction. That's 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 a rule which you might might remember. Um, and not just exo and endo, it's exo and endo with the exact same amount of energy is changing hands. So if it's minus 92 kilojoules one way, it's plus 92 kilojoules the other way. Okay. It just makes this one a bit of a problem. And this is about a 50-50 split around the room. Um, the, the question comes down to, when I write kilojoules per mole... Per mole of what? Because I've got I've got no balancing number there, and I've got three moles of hydrogen, and I've got two moles of ammonia. 
What is it kilojoule per mole of? Ammonia. So ammonia. So so if it says two NH3s there, and I've said minus 92 kilojoules, is that it's minus 92 for one mole of ammonia? So then if I doubled it, wouldn't it be 100 and something? Because I've got two. I'm making two moles of ammonia. What, what is it per mole of? Well, the, the simple answer is it's per mole of that reaction there. Per mole of that. It's one of those. One reaction in which I take one nitrogen and three hydrogens and I make two ammonias. And if I make half as much, I'll only get half as much energy released. So it is minus 46 kilojoules per mole there. And if I doubled it, if I had two ammonias and six hydrogens making four NH3, sorry, two nitrogens, yeah, six hydrogens making four ammonias, it would be double that, which is what? Minus 184. In other words, how we balance the reaction matters. And, and uh, more, more importantly, um, uh, perhaps it's something I was going to say that's completely gone out of my head. Um, yeah, yes, that's right. More importantly, in order to have a delta H, we have to have a balanced equation telling us what that delta H represents. I can't just say delta H for and then making ammonia because the reaction for making ammonia could be balanced in different ways. So I have to, I have to give you a balanced Symbol equation with a delta H. That will matter. Yes? Will we ever get asked where delta is in a formula? Like this, the answer the same. Okay, using a formula. There are, there are lots of formulae to, to work it out. I'm going to give you at least three that I can think of off the top of my head on this one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and there are going to be some definitions of some important delta H's, which we won't won't get done in today's lesson. Okay, so um, the, the bit I want to focus on now is just this idea that if I, if I change the direction of the reaction, I change the sign of the delta H. Okay, that's going to become important for Hess's law. So let's come back to Hess's law. We had a nice Nice little example here, but let's make it a bit more interesting. Let's say I've got A reacts to make B, and that's delta H1. Okay, that's fine. But now, instead, my C is going to be a common reactant that I can use to make A and B. And that's going to be delta H2. And that's going to be delta H3. Can you write for me an expression for delta H1 in terms of delta H2 and delta H3, showing the relationship between them? So here I just wrote delta H1 is delta H2 plus delta H3. What will the relationship be here? Can, can you write it down for me? All right, so... Yeah, people have written this both ways, but it's either minus delta H2 plus delta H3, or we could just say delta H3 minus delta H2. Okay, so there's, uh, and, and, and everyone got that, so you should, be, you should be fine with the third example, which is where instead of having some common reactant that I can make A and B from, now I've got some product that I can make A and B into. So again, can you write me an expression for delta H1 there, please?
you didn't get cash in your pocket. I haven't given you any numbers yet. I'm about to, but um, what? A, uh, uh, let's go over. Let's, let's go to the other side because I started with you, didn't I? Matthew, can you tell us what the expression is here, please? Um, delta H two one delta. Oh, okay. So. So the thing to keep in mind, when these diagrams get a bit more complicated, the thing to keep in mind, as I go from A to B, I'm going in the same direction as that arrow, so I'll keep the sign as it is for delta H2, but then on my way to B, I'm going in the opposite direction to that arrow, so I'll need to change the sign for delta H3, whatever it is. You've already done an example of this. Here's this. That's right, that's right. Okay, here's the reaction which you haven't done because it's very hard to do this reaction. It's very hard to give each copper sulfate exactly five waters. How would you organize that? Five for you, five for you. No, just five. It's very hard to organize. Uh, but what we can do is take copper sulfate and dissolve it. So this is the anhydrous stuff over here, yeah, the white stuff. We can take the anhydrous uh, copper sulfate and dissolve it completely in water, make it aqueous, and we'll end up with aqueous copper sulfate. And we can take the hydrated, the blue stuff, copper sulfate, and we can dissolve that in water as well. And then we'll end up with aqueous copper sulfate. We're going to have to do a bit of maths. We haven't, we haven't done the maths yet, uh, but we're going to have to do a bit. But um, let, let me just give you the numbers. So over here, we've got an exothermic reaction, uh, 66.5 kilojoules per mole. And over the other side, we have an endothermic reaction, 11.7. Positive. 11.7 kilojoules per mole. Could you tell me the enthalpy change for that reaction, please? Yeah, the, the dot, it's kind of shorthand for saying these five molecules of water are attached to the copper sulfate in a curious and interesting way that you'll come to in the last topic in year 13. Um, but for the moment, we'll just, we'll just say they're kind of associated, they're connected, they, they are actually bonded. Uh, but we just use that dot to say, you know, they're attached without worrying too much about how, how they are attached. Uh, it's called water of crystallization. Um, and we, uh, we, we do have a practical on water of crystallization, which we probably should have done by now. Um, but hey, we'll, we'll get onto that. Right. Have you got an answer? Sorry, have you got an answer? Look at this pattern here, and that, and these numbers. Are you there? That's great. So, Going to get from the left to the right, going going down this way, we're going in the same direction as that arrow. So minus 66.5, that's just a number as it is. But then on my way back, I'm going to be going in the opposite direction to that arrow. So I need to change the sign from positive to negative. What did you say? 78.2? Yeah, all right. Yeah. Okay. 78.2. 
So we can use Hess's law to, to determine delta H values that are otherwise quite hard to, to get to. These are both values we can measure directly in the lab. That's not, but Hess's law will help us get a measurement of that. Okay. I'm definitely going to leave it there. Um, so I forgot to print your topic books earlier, but they should be coming up now.